smoke you know it all right y'all free smoke we're gonna get into some free smoke free smoke is where we talk about any hot button issues personal topics anything it could be from politics to petty and today we actually have a guest and we would like to speak to this guest in regards to his background political affiliations and things like that and I'll kick it over to B because this is his homeboy. Intr- introduce your man, B. Uh, yeah. Um, got my homeboy James. I call him Jimbo. He hates that. Um, <laughs> so I call him. I call him Jimbo at work. But uh, we've been working together for give or take eight years. Um, in the course of various different positions and companies. But um, I'll tell you. I'll be honest. At first, I didn't like him because he was just like real like weird not weird but he was just like loud as hell all the time and like just kind of uh, like ob- not even obscene i can't think of the word like just obnoxious was jank- that's obnoxious fair. that's sure. fair <laughs> <laughs> he was super obnoxious super he's a super smart guy so he like he doesn't understand like how to <laughs> like not make other people feel not so smart sometimes oh. he's worked on that though he's actually gotten much better since i've known him but at first i really didn't care for him but over the course of time as you you know get around people and, and deal with them you start to learn the quirks and they learn yours and kind of figure shit out so um just in our travels and shit we've worked together at several, a couple companies at this point and um he was just a he's just a really intelligent guy um one of the whitest people i've ever met in my life um our, our first but, white guest people yeah our first white guest. Shout out to you. congratulations you made it Tough um, guy to sit in but his yeah, seat. Our first white guest, uh, just like I said, <laughs> just a regular white dude, but uh, super open minded um, and has learned a lot. And I've been, um, I'll take the credit and, you know, kind of <laughs> schooling him to the game in terms of, so like, humble. you know, black issues and things that we discussed um, that, you know, the kind of the plight of a black person. So, and he's been receptive to it, especially considering his background. Um, and I'll kind of let him, you know, speak, speak about that himself. But, um, but yeah, it's my homeboy, James. Um, towards the end we'll you know give you all his information and you can follow him and check him out he's pretty pretty dope dude so well, i'll kick it to you james tell us a little bit about yourself hey up, that's james? And, and honestly saying that i'm slightly obnoxious is very fair uh, <laughs> everybody probably including my wife thought that about me when the when they first met me um <laughs> like brandon said we've known each other for almost a decade now we work together pretty closely in a couple of different positions and br- Honestly, Brandon and a couple of other folks are a lot of the reason why my positions in politics and and racial positions have changed. I I was never a hardcore racist at all, but I think uh, Brandon has helped me a lot understand sort of the intrinsic systemic racism that sort of exists um, within the white community. And, and, you know, I come from a very, very small, very white Western North Carolina town. we had, you know, two black families. They both lived literally on the other side of the tracks from where everybody else lived. And uh, getting out of that town, being the first in my family to go to college and, and getting acclimated to other cultures has been an eye opening experience for me. And at this point, I've got two young daughters um, and my goal is to to raise them better than I was. And, and that's not yeah. to say that my parents were necessarily intentionally racist or anything to that effect but i think brandon and and our friend derek and some friends of mine from college and have helped me understand where that comes from and the genesis of that and and try to fight that from inside because you know it's it's the the solution starts with with us yeah yeah when you when you when you say that you know you you were not hardcore racist and you're growing up in western north carolina tell me about the level of racist then yes i I actually think there's there's two different kinds of racists in in, at least in white culture i think there's the obvious racist folks the people you think about or you see when you hear proud boys when you see the rebel flag hanging out um, when you hear people talk about um, white supremacy, but then there's like the latent racist, right? The person who 
isn't necessarily aware that their thoughts or their actions or the institutions that they support um, can be very racist and very suppressive and oppressive uh, regimes. And I think that that was part of my growing up, my raising was that whole it's right underneath the surface and nobody ever really calls it that because they don't want to be seen as that, but they mm-hmm. don't want to accept the fact that, you know, these thoughts that I have and these these politics that I support and these systems that, uh, you know, that I consider to be part and parcel of the American experience are blatantly oppressive, right? Mm-hmm. And so that's where I think I come from. I was much less aware of it especially within my own hometown and around the people that I grew up with, than I have become having exposed myself to other folks. Uh Uh-huh. And so when you are in your town and it's only two black people or two black families in that town, uh, how old are you? Just to give us perspective. Uh, I turned 39 recently. 39. All right. All right. So, all right. So we, we're, we're all in, in that same group. Um, so you're, you're living in that town and you're, you know, 16, 17, 18 years old, you know, are you thinking, you know, where are the black people? Are you thinking, you know, since you're never around them, are you watching them on TV? Well, are, no. What's, what's your perspective on, black culture before all of this. In well, life. Okay. So I will say one of the first memories I have of black culture is a friend of mine named Anthony going to his house um, to wait on the bus every morning and, and seeing the movie juice. Okay. okay. And we used to watch. <laughs> that's a good, that's a good. Uh, memory. <laughs> right. That was, right. Because we all growing up right in the same time right. where hip hop is, has become culture and it's taken right. over and you can't deny right. it. Right. right. It was, it's Tupac and it was Biggie and it was, you know, one of the things that I remember most about that was there's a scene in the movie where some Asian guy in a convenience store, I think, yells, I'll shoot your pee pee off. But that, that was just hilarious to us. And that's why we watched Juice, right? It's just because we thought that was funny stuff. Mm. But you never really thought about what am I missing out or, or on or where are the where are the folks of other cultural as, uh, opinions from me? Because they just, you know, everything I saw around me was homogenous it was white it was the same culture Mm -hmm. it was there was no reason to question that right um so growing up in that area and in that that sort of mind frame i think people don't think at all that they don't think about it it just it never occurs because there's never any reason to to think that there's somebody different from you and the first the first thing i remember thinking about well those there's a different group of folks out there than me was was watching the movie juice with anthony Every morning, specifically because we thought that scene was funny, but then realizing, hey, this is based on reality. This is real life for some folks that I don't ever see. What's that like? And starting to ask questions. Do do you believe in white privilege? I do believe that there is inherent privilege in being white. I've I've said this before. I, I got into this big argument on Facebook probably a year ago where I tried to make the argument that there is, in fact, white privilege, because a lot of times what you'll see is white folks will say, well, I never got anything for free, especially in poor Western or poor white communities. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've had to work my whole life. I never got anything for free. I never got any handouts. You know, I'm driving a beater car. I'm working a blue collar job, maybe two blue collar jobs. Nobody ever gave me anything. But I think essentially the crux of white privilege is the benefit of the doubt, right? So you take me, for example, I was a first generation college student. My parents were factory workers. My grandparents were factory workers. You know, we didn't have money growing up at all, but going to college was easier for me than it was for, say, Anthony, because I had access to funding for that kind of stuff. And I had a normal sounding name that didn't get my application thrown to the side. And when I got to college, I didn't have to try to fit in because I was Hell, I was the majority there, right? And so the benefit of the doubt in applying for a mortgage, right? Because my name is normal and because I'm white and because I have a, you know, there's an assumption that I'm going to be better at paying this loan off, right? So I'm going to get a benefit of the doubt there and probably be able to afford a better house or afford a mortgage. Uh, I'm going to be able to afford or to be able to get a better job. 
um, just in general, because I am much more, much more likely to be like the person across the desk from me than African Americans or Asian Americans or Hispanic Americans or anybody who doesn't look like me. I thought when you described, um, you know, when you described your town and you're describing, you know, it was white and things of that nature, and you never really had to think of anybody else. You know, you never had to think of any other culture, any other race, anything like that. And to me, that comes off as the epitome of white privilege when you don't have to think of anyone else. That's not the first thing on your mind, you know, whereas... Right. You know, when we we've been thinking about that since the beginning of time, right? Even as 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 little children, you know, we we understand that, huh? This person was treated a little bit differently. Um, even if you grow up in an all black neighborhood with all black neighbors, and you know, you're you're rarely introduced at a um, you know, in your personal life, uh, to white people. Nine times out of ten. You still have to interact with them. You know, you're, you're, you're constantly reminded of your, um, status, you know, in society. And you have to think about, you know, those types of things. So when you say, like, I didn't have to think about that, I think that that is one of the things, um, being, you know, African American and loving African American culture and things like that is like, well, how are you so, privilege that you only have to think about yourself you know and 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 then we say things like yeah because my name was normal right and we've normalized that's 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 systemic racism right there right when you say Indeed. normal you know no the net your, your name is uh better because you know. it fits the white you know <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because because it because it fits that naming convention that white people deem to be acceptable and normal and possibly white right right and that's that's a perfect example of what i'm talking about in that my just flippant use of the word normal in mm -hmm. my brain there's nothing wrong with me saying that but when i hear it repeated back to me in the way that i've said it just indicates to me how insensitive that is mm -hmm. and how Detrimental that can be if I'm in a position where I'm making the decisions over other people. If I, yes. on my end, say that my name is normal, how do I translate that in if I'm in a position of power now? If I'm in a yeah. decision-making position, right? So I, I think a lot of times the white community, especially where I'm from, rural, western, white America, it never occurs to us because it never sounds off in our head. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I heard somebody say once right. um, with regards to somebody making an inappropriate joke to them, um, ask that person to explain why it's funny. And when they can't explain why it's funny, then they understand why it's inappropriate. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. when you ask someone like me, hey, tell me why it's OK to say that your name is normal and mine's not. That's when we start to understand how we sound. Yeah. 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 I. I, I... Hmm. Well, yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, I guess. So, you know, we we talk daily um, for work and then it you know tends to trail off into a million other things. But um, I know one thing, you know, most specifically that we've discussed as of late, because it's been the political, um, I won't say nightmare, but it's just been a political fucking bizarre. Um, uh, I know, prefer nightmare. You can say nightmare. It's fair. That's true. Yeah, I prefer yeah, nightmare. nightmare. <laughs> but I mean, I guess because we're we're we we've woken up. I guess in a, in a that's sense, true. B. We'll yeah, um, yeah. So, yeah you know, I got you. It's, it's somewhat over, um, seemingly over. But nonetheless, um, I know that you know you faced. You know, this is the first time that you ever voted from the from a, the Democratic side. Um, been a staunch Republican for your entire life. Even working on, I think you said George Bush's campaign. Um, or George W, I think George W's campaign. So what was the switch for you? Like, did you, okay. So first two questions, what was the switch for you? But did you vote for Trump? Before? No, no. Okay. Uh, I was anti-Trump in 2012 when he ran against Mitt Romney. Um, mm -hmm. I, we, Mitt Romney ultimately won that. I didn't vote for Mitt Romney then either. Actually, I switched to the libertarian party and voted for Gary Johnson. Um, but I was so you wasted a vote. I'm sorry. <laughs> I said, so you wasted a vote. Well, yeah, because <laughs> let's be fair. My goal at the time was to get the Libertarian Party to 1% of the vote in North Carolina, which would have 
you know, put them on the ballot okay. every year, regardless of, you know, who their candidate was. Um, and at the time, you know, I, I like, I like Barack Obama. I thought he was a cool dude. I, you know, at the time I didn't know if I agreed with his politics or not, but I would have a beer with the dude. So I was okay with him winning and I was okay with wasting that vote. Right. Mm. Um, but in 2016, when it became clear that Trump was going to be the nominee, I, I thought there's no way I can vote for that man, regardless of if I agree with some of his politics or some of his party's politics or not. I just can't do it. But then again, I still voted libertarian because I thought there's no way in hell Hillary Clinton's going to lose to this clown. <laughs> we all made that mistake. <laughs> yes. And so, you know, after 2016 sure. rolled around, I realized my vote, my non-vote essentially had a consequence, mm -hmm. right? And so I made it my goal at that point to switch as many of my my friends and family and, and Trump supporting co colleagues as I could to the other side of the fence. Because yeah. I, I thought he was, I thought he was dangerous to the country first and foremost. I didn't realize just how bad he was until he tried to institute the ban on um, the Muslim travel travel ban, and he just made no excuses for it. He made no attempts to say that it wasn't specifically based on uh, a race or a religion. And then the separation of children from their parents at the border and putting the children freaking in concentration camps, for Christ's sake. And I mean, age. I'm not trying to minimize the Holocaust at all here, but essentially we put people in concentration camps, right? And mm -hmm. so at that point, the writing is on the wall. There is no chance in hell that this person is not a xenophobe. There's no chance in hell this person is not a racist. There's no chance in hell that he has got a good bone in his body. And it became early, quite clear pretty early on that I was going to have to find a Democratic candidate to vote for. Otherwise, I was going to continue to be part of the problem. Even if I didn't vote for him, I was going to continue yeah. to be part of the problem. And so I spent the last four years doing the best I could to illustrate to my friends and my family, the people from back home, here's why he's not good for us. Because at the end of the day, in order to get buy-in, you have to get people to understand what's in it for them, right? And so my goal is to make the world a better place for my kids and for your kids and for all races and for all religions and for all genders, but I got to find a way to hook in the people who disagree with me and show them that it's good for them. So I did spent the last four years trying my best to show them why Donald Trump was bad for them. But my ultimate goal was to get the man out because I thought he was dangerous to anybody who didn't look like me. So you gave this, you gave this, uh, great, you know, thought of, you know, how you would like, you know, you saw, you saw these bad things happening you know, you saw Trump was dangerous and things like that. Let's go back, a, go back a little bit further when, you know, you were a staunch Republican. What was it about the party that attracted you? How did you identify with that party? Because I'm thinking Western North Carolina, you know, I'm not thinking rich white family, you know, you've kind of described kind of like your background. Uh, my perception is that, you know, Republicans are really for the rich and then everybody else falls. So, so give us some insight on why you were Republican and, you know, the things that, you know, represents being Republican. What were you proud about do, during that time guns about being Republican? Uh, guns and God. Guns and God. And, and honestly, I'm not a hunter. I, I own a pistol, but I'm not a hunter. I'm not a religious individual, but rural white America is steeped in guns and God. And the Republicans have done a really, really good job of tying themselves to the flag, to guns, and to the Bible. And so you can't extract that identity from the voter, right? So you look at look at AOC, for example, or look at Elon mm -hmm. Omar, or you know, people who are moderate, in my opinion, they're reasonably moderate individuals for their parts of the country, right? Mm -hmm. They don't look like, even if they were to have conservative viewpoints, they don't look like normal conservatives, right? And so guns and God is what I was born into, and that's what I was raised in, and that's, I never questioned anything. And again, it goes back to, I never had a reason to think differently. 
Right. And so I grew up thinking I was a Republican. I grew up thinking Republicans were for the country folks. I grew up thinking Republicans were for, you know, Mm. hard work and for individual liberties and for protecting my right to own a weapon and protecting my right to worship whatever God I wanted to worship. And so that's just kind of how I went. There was never a, you know, I never woke up one day and decided I was a Republican. It just that was the way it was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Born into it. Yeah. So and, how and how is the go ahead? I'm well, sorry. The first time I started to think differently about that was Trayvon Martin. Really? Because you know the Florida stand your gun, stand your ground laws, and all those kind of things with George Zimmerman and the and the the defense of George Zimmerman from the Republicans. Well, he you know Trayvon Martin shouldn't have been where he was, and he shouldn't have you know he shouldn't have looked suspicious. And I started to think, well, that just makes no sense to me because the mm-hmm. kid was minding his own damn business. The kid was doing. What I was taught I was supposed to be doing, taking care of myself, you know, protecting myself, doing the things I should be doing. Yet this Mm -hmm. guy who's been told by the police, who I'm told are here to protect me, who's been told by the police to stay in his car, gets out of his car and goes after this kid. And it's somehow the kid's fault. Yeah, I didn't. I never understood that. And so that's sort of. There was the support for George Zimmerman and the 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 vitriol toward Trayvon Martin really that started the dam breaking. Yeah. Where where do you think that support was for like Philando Castile who was a gun carrying member of the NRA? It didn't matter. It didn't matter because he doesn't look like us. You see? So that yeah, no, I I get it. <laughs> I get it. I know it's steeped in racism, you know, and 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 it's 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 God and and guns, and it's one God. It's not the right to worship whatever God you right. want, you know. It's that's not what it is. And guns, who exactly, who exactly are you protecting yourself from? If you guys are all on the same side, why do you need your guns? You know what I mean? It's to go against others the way I take that. But yeah. well, let I, me know your thoughts on that. I think it's at least in the South. Now, in the North, it might be different. But in the South, if you grew up white, you grow up with this opinion of the Civil War that's not right. You grow up with this opinion of the Civil War that it was a just war and a noble war. And we may have lost, but we were trying to save ourselves. And, and we were trying to make sure that we protected our rights and our ability to, to determine our own fate. Right. Mm. And so it goes back, especially when it's taught by the daughters of the Confederacy who manipulated all the textbooks. To, right. You know, write it their way. The mm-hmm. lost cause of the Confederacy is a real strategy by Confederate sympathizers back then in the Democratic Party. But after civil rights reform, a lot of those Democrats left and went to the Republican Party. But it was a. An, a a strategy by those folks to change the narrative around what calls the Civil War. It was, we were here to determine our own destiny. We were here to protect our own self. That's what the South is about. That's what conservatism is about, is protecting your own self, right? From what? Nobody knows at this point. Literally. <laughs> like, all I understand is that I'm supposed to be fighting for my rights and my ability to self-determine what happens to me. And mm. that's the th- I, part of the, what bothers me about the response to coronavirus is that, you know, the, the United States was mm. founded, at least the white part of the United States was founded on the, this idea of individual liberties. We've never done anything in this country for the collective good ever, mm. Right? Mm. with maybe the exception of, of World War Two. But we can't we can't look at other folks and say, you know what, I need to do this for them. No, it's like, nah, bitch, I got to go. I got to I'm not gonna wear my mask and I got to go to the bar because that's my right as an individual. Yeah. Right. The wildest yeah. thing in the world is the fact that white people are being have, have never faced oppression. And now that they face oppression by having to wear a mask is the wildest shit in the world. Like, that's not even oppression, first and foremost. But they feel yeah. like, in, in their mind, they think wearing a mask is fucking like this is against my civil rights. No, it's not. It's not about being. It's no civil liberty <laughs> in this motherfucker. It's just about protecting your stupid ass. Right. But I would Life also say that I don't think that the majority of folks believe that they're wrong, right? So I don't think that they believe that their actions are inherently oppressive. I don't think they believe that their actions are against the collective good. I think they think they're making the right choice because that's what society needs from them. 
Because that's what they've been taught. Does that make sense? No. Not really. But how, let's see. So growing so, up, I said earlier okay. that you know, folks didn't want to be considered, didn't want to be called racist because they didn't view themselves as racist, right? The latent racism in white community being, I support this thing because I've been told it's good for me. It's in my best interest. But meanwhile, you've got the the powers that be behind these folks pulling the levers because it benefits the person in power, right? So you've got Jim, you've got Jim Bob in Kernersville, North Carolina, saying, yes, I'm going to vote for my personal liberties and I'm going to vote for my ability to not wear a mask and I'm going to vote for my ability to exclude votes in Atlanta because it's, you know, it protects my personal liberties. But Jim Bob from Kernersville, North Carolina, doesn't understand that the man who's convinced him that that's in Jim Bob's best interest is actually using Jim Bob to maintain power. Mm hmm. So it's a, yep. it's a, it's education. Right, right. And so Lyndon Johnson has a quote, very famous quote, that's taken out of context a lot. But essentially it was, if you can convince the poorest white man that he's got it better than the richest black man, you've won. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Johnson was using... He'll give you his last dollar or some shit like that. Yeah, Johnson that's, was using yeah. that specifically to illustrate to opponents well, proponents of the civil rights movement, hey, this is how they've got them by the balls, basically. Right? And But it's th that's the case. You've convinced Jim Bob from Kernersville, North Carolina, that he is better than the voters in Detroit or Atlanta uh -huh. or Philadelphia, and that his vote is worth more and that his interests are worth more. Right? You've convinced him of that. He doesn't, though, he doesn't understand that you're using him to maintain your mm -hmm. own power. So we have a, a, a saying on this show that all all roads lead to slavery, right? We feel like uh, white people vote against their interest. Um, we feel like there are 75, I mean, 75 million white people that are basically being an army for the one percent. Yes, <laughs> you know yeah. they they you know they they vote against everything that is for them. That is outside of guns and God, right? right? And then you, they also manipulate the Bible. It's not like they they're following the Bible and uh, and and all of these things and the guns. You know what I mean? What eye for eye, all that. So it just seems like a lot of Things are against their own interests and 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 against all the things that they say that they stand for. Right, right. So you have, um, you know, like like B Hill said, like the most oppression that you felt is, is is wearing a mask, right? And when you hear about black people being murdered in the streets and things like that by cops and all of that, it's well, you know, they should have complied. They should have complied. You should have this gun on you and not be scared. You should have this gun on you. I'd like to point out that Breonna Taylor was asleep. Yes. Exactly. Like, I hate the argument. Like sure. if you would just do what the cops tell you to do, you wouldn't be in trouble. Breonna Taylor was asleep. There was a gentleman, uh, Philander Castillo had a legal weapon and told him he had a legal weapon. Mm -hmm. There was a, a caretaker for a, a, a gentleman who had a mental disability who was sitting on a curb that was shot. Like, how is that not compliance? Why? Exactly. So we give you uh, the general you. We give you the um, mandate of wear a mask, not only to protect the other people, but to protect yourself as well, to, to protect me, Ma, to protect all of you in, you know, in, 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 in rural states where, you know, you got diabetes and high blood pressure and all these underlying conditions where a fucking virus can just take you to fuck out and you don't want to comply, you know, because you're white and you feel like, how dare you tell me what to do right when you're having these conversations do you first of all do you know like anti-maskers yes or anti-covid i don't know what we're calling these idiots yeah so, uh, keep actually, it all the same One what, what is their discussion that that's always my thing with you know having these types of discussions when you're you're asking um 
a white person? Why this? Why that? There's never a good answer. Well, so I had a, a, a very big falling out with some of my dad's side of the family over this because a friend of mine or a cousin of mine is, is a hairdresser. She's from Western North Carolina and she's an anti-masker and you're not going to tell me what to do. And so I specifically said, trying to understand her point of view, you know, to it help me understand, you know, your perspective, because I don't I don't agree with you, but I want to know what you think. Right. And her her response there was no other attempt to explain her position. Her response was, you can kiss my white ass. I don't owe you shit. Mm. So. Mm. Sounds like she lost the fight already. Mm -hmm. The position is, you're not going to tell me what to do. And I'm going to live my life the way I want to. And so then when you say to them, well. I don't drive drunk. I don't have to, you know, it's up, it's up to you to avoid me when I'm drunk, right? I can drive drunk. It's, you know, if I hurt myself, <laughs> it's up to me. It's, it's fine. Yeah. They don't understand the parallel between the two, right? Yeah, because a they're in they're not in control of anything. Mm. Right. That segment of the population generally has been just as poor as any yeah, other segment exactly. of, the, of America has been just as unhealthy as any other segment of America. And whether they want to agree mm -hmm. with it or not, has been oppressed as any other segment of America, but with the obvious exception of the evils of slavery. They but they don't want to accept that it's their folks doing it to them. And so they will find a scapegoat. Coronavirus <laughs> is the current scapegoat. I don't have any control over this. I can't control whether or not I get it. I have to go to work and I got to make money because I'm making somebody else rich every time I go into work and they're not going to give me any help. So I'm going to find a scapegoat. And mm -hmm. that's all it is. <laughs> so that they don't, uh, it all, again, I keep, I keep saying education, 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 because I, I'm so confused as to why, you know, my seven year old little cousin understands, you know, um, I'm why my 15 year old niece understands, you know, why these, you know, children understand the importance of mask and, and how we, um, keep them, uh, safe and how it keeps us safe and all of these things. Why can't those people understand? Like, why would you rather die for the perception of power that you really don't have in the grand scheme of things, right? It's this illusion of power. It's this illusion of white supremacy that you have. When again, all you're working for is really the 1% is playing you for a puppet to right. be the army, right? You're poor. Mm -hmm. You, like you say, you're working two, two blue collar jobs. You're living in a trailer. You don't have anything. Right. And now you're sacrificing your life in the, and, and the life of your children, you know, the life of your parents, all for this illusion of power. So I heard somebody suggest once that with regards to religion in rural communities that a person who grows up in a very small town and goes to church, that church is everything they know. It is their family. It is their friends. It is their community. It is them. And so if you then you ask them questions about that church or you you bring up a legitimate criticism of that church, you're criticizing them as an individual because they can't separate the two. Right. The same thing works with their politics. They're so invested in being this person, this this conservative, this person who's God and guns, this person who is a Trump supporter, you're not going to tell me what to do, that even when you present them with facts that prove them wrong, it's a personal attack on them now. And so they become defensive, right? So you're not now questioning or having or even trying to have a conversation about why they believe what they believe. You're questioning them and their worth as a human being. And they yeah. can't, they can't. <laughs> they can't cross that divide because it makes them what what happens to them mentally because i think that it's well it's, it's different inferior i mean it just puts them they, they feel like and i mean from outside looking in obviously but just from what his explanation is in my opinion it looks like they're they're inferior and they're on the level of of you know a, a person of color you know what i mean like when you're at this 
when you ever you're on a pedestal, you never know you're on a pedestal till you get knocked down. Like, oh shit. Mm. Like I'm not even, you know, like I'm on the ground with y'all motherfuckers. Like I didn't know that. Like mm. it's easy to talk shit from, from a high. So when you, you know, when you're, when you're humble essentially, um, and, and it may not necessarily even be monetarily or it might not be, you know, physically or whatever. But when it's like, when you're brought down to the level of everybody else, like you just, and some people just like to buck the system and this is their opportunity to do that. Even if it, you know, is to their own detriment. So it's weird. It's weird. Shit. It is very difficult to be proven wrong. And I've been proven wrong. Look, I'm married. I'm used to being wrong. <laughs> all right. Oh. But it's very difficult to be proven wrong because you build, you put so much of yourself into a position and you have these facts and you have these figures that back them up and these stances for why you are who you are. And then all of a sudden, here comes someone who says, well, no, this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong. And your immediate reaction is to get, well, fuck you, man. Like, who are you, who are you to come up in my face and tell me who I am? And so I feel like that's where it comes from because they've invested so much in this position that the minute you start to have a conversation with them about why they feel like they, they do, A, <clears throat> they're not really sure. If you come at them with facts, B, they can't come back <laughs> at you with facts. And they're exactly. just going to shut down and they're going to look at whoever they're talking to as the enemy. Period. Yeah. Point blank. Yeah. And so they're you gonna... just put a mirror in front. And I mean, a lot of people don't like what they see in the mirror. You know what I mean? Listen. That, that's Go what ahead. It down to me. No, I'm just saying that, you know, folks, when, you know, it's easy to, it's easy to cast out shit and then until you got to look back in the mirror and say like, oh shit, you got to deal with reality and like, you know, self-worth or lack thereof. So, um, you know, it's just a reflection of the shit that, you know, that you basically dishing out, but you can't take it type deal. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what is very interesting to me is I understand 60 year old racist, 70 year old racist, 80 year old racist. You had a lack of information. You were ignorant. You were able, you, you took the information that had been taught to you over the years, myths about people of color, black people, all of this, three fifths of a man, they're, they're, they're animals. They're this, they're that, right? There is no reason in my mind for a 39 year old person, a 40 year old person, you know what I mean? A 20 year old person that has access to our good sis Google <laughs> that can find any information that you want to understand whatever you want that has access to social media that's getting all of this information. Even if you're not an intellectual, you're on social media, right? Even if you follow all white people, right? You follow all white people on social media, all of this. You can't tell me that there aren't discussions within your white threads of someone maybe like James that's saying, hey, this is not right. This is not right. X, Y, Z. And you're still choosing to live in that level of ignorance in 2020 when you, when, when, when black people dictate culture. So you like Beyonce, but you don't like black people. Right. Right. You know what I mean? You, you want to be like Rihanna. You want to be sassy. You want to, you, you want to do the TikToks. You want to do to the black songs. You want to do everything black. You love the culture, right, but you still too. don't <laughs> like the people. Right. So how does that work? Like, how does that work? And, and even in Western North Carolina, well, where loop. you have information. So it's a feedback loop. You have 85% of your, of your contacts telling you one thing. Then you get this 15% that say, Hey, that doesn't sound right. But then the 85% get louder and say, they're idiots. Don't listen to them there. It's a libtard. Don't pay attention mm -hmm. to what they're saying go to this website or go to Fox news or go listen to Rush Limbaugh and, and get that, get that reinforcement. So there's a, there's a radio station in Grand Theft Auto five that plays a clip of a Fox news parody radio station. And their slogan is reinforcing your prejudices. That's mm. what happens. You start to ask questions and then your, your prejudices get reinforced. And unless you get out of that, feedback loop the logical voices can't be loud enough to drown out the illogical voices okay so i got i got exactly what you said right but when you're living and experiencing 
the effects of a Trump presidency, right? Everyone's sick. Everyone's out of work. Your plant has shut down in your small town. You don't have a job. You're suffering through all of these things. Right. So even if you're not one to go out and search for information or be told, you're actually feeling the impacts that is against everything about you. Yes. Why, why doesn't because it sink in being, then? Because they're, because they're being told, don't believe your eyes, your ears and your, and your thoughts your and bank your accounts. feelings. This is not a real virus. They're trying to control you. Um, coronavirus didn't shut down your, um, your factory, it was China. And look, I'm fighting China. Um, it, it's this, again, you have a question in front of you and you start to ask, well, where is this coming from? And then they've got a very convenient answer to put you back where you need to be so that they can continue to have you where they need you to be. Right. Mm. So what is it? Some 80% of Republicans, hardcore Republicans will only watch Fox News. And I'll bring up the fact that, you know, I'll watch, I'll watch Fox News just to see what they're saying, but then I'll also go to yeah. CNN and I'll also go to the Washington Post and I'll go to NPR. Well, those are just liber, liberal uh, trash dumps. Why would you go there? They're not telling you the real story. They're being told not to believe what they experience on their own, that, that what you're seeing mm -hmm. is not real. What we're telling you is real. Mm -hmm. You should believe us and do what we tell you to do. You know what? You know who else white folks did that to? Black Please. folks. It's called slavery. Yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dude, this is right. all it is. It's the fundamental. All roads lead to slavery. I'm telling all you, roads lead to slavery. Uh, everything leads. And back this to goes back even before slavery. There is a book called White Trash: The 400 Year History of Class in America. And yes, America is not 400 years old, but essentially it traces back the suppression of the poor to England and the Church mm -hmm. of England and two specific doctrines of english society that said poverty was a disease and the best way to cure mm -hmm. england of the disease was not to to raise the poor out of poverty but was to ship them off the entire purpose of well one of the purposes of the new world quote unquote was to get rid of the poor in england and ship them off but what happened was that the poor who got shipped out of england took after their masters in england and just reinstituted the same system. So yes, mm -hmm. you're absolutely right. But that mm -hmm. one percent of the world's population has used the same tactics from the very beginning, since we developed wealth, since we decided it was more important for a few people to have everything and control it. They've used that throughout the eons, and they're still using it today. It happens. Bro, bro. It happens that in America, African Americans and Africans have been the unmitigated and un like been the, the ones who have suffered the most. Correct. Absolutely. But we've been doing yeah. this shit to people on other continents who are other races. I mean, the fucking English did this to the Irish. The English did this to mm -hmm. the Welsh. It didn't matter that they were white. It did, it did, the fact it was that they were poor. Yeah. yeah. It just yeah. so happens that in America, the majority of poverty happens to be in minority communities. Because of systemic yes. racism. Yes. When, when, when you, so I have this thought that I've been unable to, um, not prove as accurate. I say that white people as a collective have never been on the right side of history. Never. Sure. I can't think of one incident or one big time in American, major time in American history or <laughs> shit. We can go back to England if you want to. In which, you know, white people as a collective have been on the side of good. Nah. What do you believe in that? What do you believe about my, my thought on that? Well, so my experience of history is different from yours, obviously. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> I can look back at parts of, of white history on the world stage and, and show where we have been beneficial. But I can completely understand your perspective. Right, because but tell us from your perspective. Tell tell us those things. Enlighten well, me so on I those events that, that you're the thinking formation about. Formation of government in Greek society. Well, I, I started to say that, but then mm. society and government mm -hmm. started in Mesopotamia. 
So I've already lost my argument there, right? So I was going to start to say the formation <laughs> of government. Yeah, first syllable, so first right. civilization in, it was in Egypt, in, which is obviously in Africa. So, um, right. and, and I can, so, I can 100% understand where you're coming from because white all, people are responsible for the Holocaust. And white people are responsible <laughs> for slavery. And white people are responsible for the vast majority of wealth oppression in the world. And that makes a whole lot of sense to me. And I get exactly where you're coming from there. And killing off the Indians. and Kill, Yeah, we just that's celebrated it. Indian Murder Day. Indian Massacre. I mean, that's fair. Yeah. That's fair. And, and, and listen, sure. I'm not saying this so, you know, you 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 can't concede. I really want to know, like, because that's really my thought. I really cannot think of or research a time in history where it was like, Oh, these white people as a majority was out for the good. Well, so, now we, yeah. we've always had white people on the side of good, but as a, as a group, you know, as a group, I can't think of any major events in which other people outside of white people benefited from a major change now, in history say, or society and things like that. I will 100% agree with that statement right there. There's never really been a major impact in the world where white people weren't the major benefactor, benefactors of that of that advantage. One hundred percent, one hundred percent agree with that. Yeah, um, with with, with uh, you know, all the things that that has gone on, you know, up and up until up until this point, and you've changed. You have you changed your party affiliation? Or is it just that you think Trump is retarded, so you just didn't vote for him? What 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 is your? It's a little bit of both what, because honestly, okay. um, uh, I, there's nothing in the Republican Party anymore that I can get down with because of the hypocrisy of the whole last four years, right? So you can tell me. For example, Chuck Grassley the other day said that, you know, Janet Yellen, uh, who has been Joe Biden's nominee for Treasury Secretary, she was former uh, Fed chair under Barack Obama. She's one of the smartest women on the freaking planet, right? Nobody has ever thought Janet Yellen was not qualified for the role. And Chuck Grassley said, you know, I don't have any issues against her, but I need to see her tax return. I can't, even if that's a legitimate point to make, I can't take that at face value because of the last four years and you've been helping the most corrupt president since Warren Harding hide his tax returns, right? So the entire Republican Party is based on a hypocrisy Go now, away. Go in my out. opinion. So I don't belong to them anymore. I might have conservative Close viewpoints in some manners. And a lot huh? of the viewpoints that I had have been completely changed. They're not conservative anymore. Um, because it, it's been shown to me that I was wrong in the first place. Mm -hmm. What what viewpoints have you held on to and which viewpoints have well, you Well, I changed? firmly believe in affirmative action right now. I did not believe in affirmative action uh, prior to this, but in the last four years, probably in the last decade, but at least in the last four years, I've decided that, you know, it not, might not necessarily be my fault that the system is racist, but it's my responsibility to fix it. And how do I do okay. that? Well, okay. if that means that I've got to give minorities an ab ability to get into a college, you know, that they wouldn't have had to begin with. And I'm fine with that. If it means that we need to consider reparations in whatever way that those mm -hmm. would be, if those would be individual payments or if they would be direct investments in minority communities, I'm fine with that because it's my responsibility to fix it. So those are not conservative viewpoints at all. And those are viewpoints that yeah. have changed. I've also come to the conclusion that it really comes down to education, access to health care, and access to capital. And we've mm -hmm. got to do things. The, the, the old phrase that rising tide raises all boats is not true. Mm -hmm. You've got to build the boat up. And if you're going to do that, you're going to have to give the same advantages to minority communities, whether they be African-American, Hispanic-American, well, whatever, yeah. that I've had myself. Right? And those yeah. are not conservative viewpoints at all. And I'm asking you this question. I know you, again, I know you're not, you can't speak for all white people. I know that. But from a perspective of, so we have this, this constant conversation of 
black people, we don't want to take anything from you guys. Whatever you have, whatever you've accumulated, your wealth, your status, your whatever, you can have all that. We, we're not trying to subtract from anything that you have. We're just trying to have the same opportunities to attain whatever it is we want to attain. Some of us just trying to attain a job place where we can go in and feel comfortable. We're not even trying to attain, you know, millions of dollars and take your fucking oil and take your, you know what I mean? Take all these things that you own. We just want to be able to send our kids to the store for Skittles in Arizona. You know what I mean? We we want to be able to, uh, you know, let let our husbands and wives and things like that go to the store and come back and not be killed in a random traffic stop. You know, we want to be able to go spend our money wherever we want to and not be followed or profiled or, or, or anything like that. When you have the, the, the richest woman in the woman in the world, you have Oprah Winfrey being followed around the store. That is a problem. You know, that, that, that is a problem. You know, in the, in this land of God and guns, um, which, Again, both of those things still lead me back to racist shit, <laughs> just based on how that is, how they manipulate God and guns. What is it that, based on your conversations and, and, and the people that you know, what do white people, Trump supporters, uh, staunch Republicans think that we want from them? Like, what's the problem? Currently, so I, so I think they've been sold a bill of goods. So I, I like what you said. What when you said we're not trying to take what you have, we're just trying to attain, you know, mm-hmm. the same level of success. So what has been sold to the proletariat, for lack of a better term, is that oh, they're coming to take everything you have. They're coming mm. to take what you have earned. They're coming to take what you've worked hard for. That is not actually what's actually happened, but that's how. So if you take if you take that position, they're coming to take your stuff, then they don't Joe Sixpack doesn't have to sympathize with you. Joe Sixpack doesn't have to understand how difficult it is to not be white in America. Joe Sixpack doesn't have to understand and come to terms with the fact that, you know, his vote and his position are keeping minorities in sort of quote unquote in their place, right? Mm-hmm. But he doesn't also understand that what he's been told is a lie. We have bought Mm. into the fact that we've been sold by the rich, that what negatively affects the rich negatively affects us. And that's not true at all. At all. At all. At all. And I have this argument. People are worried about tax cuts, Biden tax cuts. Right. I make $20,000 a year. Yeah, exactly. If you got like tax increases. Right. I'm like, bro, if you have got vinyl underpinning in your trailer, you ain't got to worry about a Biden (laughs) tax cut. Like, it's not a thing that you have to worry about. But they've been told so long and by so many people that they're here to take your guns. And Trump has said that they're going to take your guns. He's literally said that they're here to take your money. They're here to, you know, they're, they're, Trump has literally said they're going to move into suburbia and they're going to destroy suburbia. They've been told that for so long and by so many people that that's what they believe. And they cannot be dug out of that position. What were you saying, B? Right. So they came, they, 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 they did the white flight, moved out to suburbia, right? And then, you know, we got the city back popping. So now they come back into the city gentrify all that shit and try to move everybody out to suburbia because now the, 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 the city is, is, is the place where it should be. So it's kind of like they, you know, it's kind of like they want whatever is not theirs at that point in time, you know? And, and it's very interesting to me that especially let me ask this question. If someone supports Donald Trump, because this Trump 2020 flag has basically replaced the Confederate flag, is it fair for me to assume that you're racist? I think it's fair for you to assume that all white people are inherently racist. 
There's a difference between, you know, you have microaggressions versus you're flying this flag outside of your business. You're flying this flag outside of your business because you want to make a statement. You've, you, you, you put this uh, flag outside of your house because you want to make a statement about who lives there and what they believe in. We we've, we've had this ongoing theme throughout this conversation tonight that it is I like living in a fantasy, right? We we've determined that the 1% is basically running this group of people and, and they're believing it. Whatever they're being told by Fox News and all of those other individuals with money, you know, you you said this a, a thousand times in this conversation. They believe it even though, you know, there's nothing to back up anything that's being told to them. It's just the fact that it's coming out of the mouth of a person that they trust. For whatever reason, they trust them. Even if your bank account, your home life, your circumstances, your convictions, your all of that does not align with what they're telling you. You're still like. I'm about this. <laughs> I'm about supporting Donald Trump. You said, uh, they said initially he's a businessman. That's why, you know, even though he has all these failed businesses, doesn't pay taxes. We probably have more money than Donald Trump. You know what I mean? Like seriously. And that's what they hung their hat on before. Like he's a businessman. They're not hanging their hat on that now. It's just kind of like, leave me alone. We don't want to wear masks. That's what we're hanging this on. I feel that all of them are that that you have to hate something, in my opinion, to love Donald Trump. So that's that's the, that's the crux of the situation right there. And I don't think Donald Trump is the cause of anything. I think Donald Trump is the final symptom of the disease. Oh, yeah. Donald Trump didn't come to power in a vacuum. He was recruited yeah. and molded by people who wanted the things that he has embodied. And mm-hmm. he was trained or <laughs> trained as a, as a negative word. It's a bad word to use, but it's the best way I can describe it. He was trained to reflect those things that the people who were going to vote for him are scared of. It's marketing. Yes. It's a hundred percent. He marketed. He found an audience they, and he marketed. They marketed him. Yeah. Correct. Well, I mean, you're the, right. Charles, the Coke brothers who were uh, yep. head yep. of Coke industries, right? Um, Charles Coke mm-hmm. gave, gave an interview the other day where he said he he regrets that the money that he put into politics has turned the nation into such a divided country. But the whole purpose mm-hmm. of his investments into politics was turned to turn the country into a divided country. Dr. King said it best. If they got white, poor white people and poor black people fighting against each other, they're going to win. Yeah. And so yeah. the entire way they stay in power is to prevent the common man from realizing he's got everything in common with his fellow common man mm-hmm. and not the person who controls the levers of power. Mm-hmm. Whether that's Washington, Europe, the economy, you name it. He, Donald Trump was picked by people who needed to have a charismatic cult leader, essentially cult leader to drive the vote of the people they needed to control. Hmm. I get it. I, 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 you know, I just can't. So in, in, in the black community and B you can, you can chime in if you feel like I'm going left with this, but I feel like in, in the black community, um, you know, it's, at its core, you know, it's all God, right? It's all, it, it, it's God in the white community and black community is God. Um, uh, religion has manipulated both races and races of people. Um, religion has always been used as a factor to manipulate, right? They used to, you know, change the Bible to have slaves worshiping their masters and, and bullshit like that. And, you know, you have these same fucking, you know, rule. And I can't, I, I don't even know if all these people are rule because we, you know, we see in New York and, you know, LA and all of these Karens and Kevins going off about dumb bullshit, racist bullshit. But you have, you know, 
these these individuals that are it's God. You know, what I mean, we're just gonna let God handle it. We're gonna pray about it, and da 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 da. You've had this this evolution of, I guess, understanding to uh, vote if not in your interest, for the interest of the greater good, right? And then uh, on the African-American side and, and black culture, like you have somebody like myself, right? So I'm always, you know, I'm college educated. I have two degrees and, you know what I mean? I'm, I, I consider myself woke, you know what I mean? With the uh, air quotes around it, I consider myself woke. And, and as you attain information, you try to educate your people. So the same way that you probably have conversations with, with your family about, well, that perspective may not be right. We're doing the same thing. We're doing the same thing on our side to say, listen, these white people manipulating you. These are the facts, you know, X, Y, Z. And, 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 and I think about like our mothers and older people like that. And they're just like, look, we just going to pray about it. You know, we going to, we going to let, let go and let God and, you know, and, and, and let them I white people. The faith without work dead, right? So that part of like, go, let go, let God. But in the Bible, but yeah. it says faith without work is dead. So yes, you can believe in something. You have to have the faith in that find the steer you through, but you also have to work towards it too. Mm-hmm. So I think that faith was, is not magic. That's what yeah, I always I tell think, people. I think that was on, on display this last election because I felt like uh, you know, people were at their wits end uh, on all sides. Obviously, yeah, well, yeah. Honestly, it had to be that many white people to you know join the party because it wasn't just black people. While yes, we he, Joe Biden certainly won because off the backs of blacks. We're still Correct. a minority in this country. So Correct. a lot of white folks experience a lot of loss and, you know, monetarily and, and family and socially and shit. So that shit definitely, you know, that paid, paid the price. Well, and, and I will say from my perspective, I am not a religious individual at all. Uh, Brandon, yeah. Brandon knows my religious perspective and, and he, he makes fun of me about it all the time, which is cool. But I've had a lot of folks that I grew up with who were very religious come to me and say, hey, look, what really did it for me was the fact that, you know, what he is espousing and what the, the policies that they are pursuing and the things that he is saying, they're not Christian. You know, those are not yeah. Christian. You know, the, the thing that one of the things that I found to be most indicative of the difference between the two was somebody posted, if Jesus were to come back today, Republicans would call him a libtard. Mm-hmm. And that's that's 100 percent accurate. But what has happened is you've got evangelicals who have, because of financial, you know, interests, uh, have prosperity doctrine, for example, right? So the the whole idea behind prosperity doctrine is that God wants you to be rich, He wants you to be successful, He wants you to, you know, to have all these things, and that might not necessarily be wrong. But you look at somebody like Joel Osteen, right? Who is a very famous white evangelical pastor who's living in mm-hmm. a multi million dollar house and and preaching mm-hmm. in front of a you know a, 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 a church that has more uh, seats in it than a college basketball arena and has private jets mm-hmm. and those kind of things. I mean, mm-hmm. from my understanding of Christianity, Jesus flood. wasn't a millionaire. Yeah, right. and he wouldn't let people have a flood in, like when they were fucking abandoned and right. had nowhere to go to seek refuge. Right. So. Yeah, I, you know, I personally, I don't really trust religion. I'm a spiritual person. <laughs> I don't trust saying. religion when you can, when, when you file tax returns for religion, like, right. you know what I mean? When you, when you, when you can make it a business, when you can go major in, you know, be, being, uh, you know, when you can go to school and get a degree in something, that's a business. Yeah. You know, that is, that, that is a business and, you know, it's unfortunate because I feel like everyone, regardless of race, should you should always explore and see what's best for you and i don't have to down religion if that's what you need to guide you i think of spirituality is more so of and staying it very simply like a motivational speaker yeah you know like this is you know this these are the things that can get you going and motivate you to accomplish and fulfill your life in 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 the ways that in which you want to fulfill that um but when when we're talking about God and, and and the way that that is being manipulated, and then you see these individuals in the pulpit, 
just like what B. Hill said, you, you preach all of these things, right? And then there's a flood and you're like, oh, can't nobody get in my great building. You know what right. I mean? Like, this is not for y'all. This is so it look good on the, on, on the screen when I'm live broadcasting, you know, this, 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 this stage that I'm on and I'm able to control people. Cause at the end of the day, you know, it, you call Trump a cult leader. I always called him that. I'm like, he's a, he's a cult leaders are able to motivate people in ways that go totally against whatever they have, whatever charisma, because I feel like Trump is just a blatant idiot. Like he's not even, um, He's not even a talented, you know what I mean? Like manipulator. He's talented. I will say he's talented. He, he, he I don't think he's talent. talented. I think he's, he That's, has he's a lot of stupid talented. individuals. In, in no, sense, he's talented. He's right. If we ever get a leader who wants to be as authoritarian and fascist as Donald Trump wants to be, but he's a little bit more intelligent, we're screwed. A little bit more. We're screwed. That's true. 100%. 100%. How, how has your relationships um, changed since you kind of, change your stance on certain things with your friends and family. How how has that been? I've stopped talking about politics with some of them. I've stopped talking to some of them. Mm. Um, you know, there are folks that I love and cherish and I look at them and understand that you know, this is who they support and I can't I can't bridge that gap, right? That dichotomy between the two is is something I can't mm-hmm. understand. Yeah. Which is kind of why I started blogging in the first place, because I was trying to understand who I was and how I got to where I am. And if I felt like mm-hmm. if, if I put that down in writing, that I would understand who they are. But there, I mean, mm. a lot of times I would get any you know, I'll have conversations answer? and I'll look at somebody and I'll literally say, you're smarter than that. Like I just I had a conversation recently with a friend of mine who said, you know, we we got to protect. Uh, the Senate in Georgia, because, you know, all these socialist Democrats. I was like, Brian, you're an intelligent man. You went to NC State University. You have a degree in psychology. You are not stupid. You don't honestly believe that. But Hmm. deep down to like his marrow, he does. And I can't. I can't figure that out. Has anybody ever said anything just. Blatant, like the reason I do this is because I hate black people or I hate something like, is there always a justification? Like, even if they can't articulate themselves to say, this is exactly why I'm for this. Do they give you any type of indication? I've been lucky enough to weed those people out of my life before the Trump administration. Like I knew them before this, but I decided really early on, I didn't want anything to do with them. And I left them behind, and I'm sure that has occurred. And there might be some folks that I still associate with who think those things quietly and under their breath mm-hmm. and say those things in company that, you know, would be receptive to that. But I make it very clear from the very beginning, I ain't putting up with it. Yeah. It's not something I'm here to entertain. And if you're going to bring that trash, then I'm, I'm you know, we're going to have this conversation and you're going to lose. And so folks tend not to come to me with that. But thankfully. I haven't had mm-hmm. that experience, but again, okay. most of what I've experienced is that they either are ignorant to the fact that the positions that they take are so oppressive, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or they sort of low key want the status quo to stay what it is, and they will admit that it's wrong. But you know, I'm doing okay, and so you know, it's about me and my it's about me and mine. You know what I mean? With 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 um, white women supporting Trump at, I think it was 55, 56% of the vote went to Trump. Um, we understand from being a minority, right? And then, you know, you have women next, right? So Trump has clearly gave his stance on women in general. You can pull any piece of audio, video, whatever to understand. Pull some clothing. (laughs) You know, he pulled clothing, grabbed things. You know, he's 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 grabbed pussies. He's he's been uh, on Jeff Epstein's island a bunch of times. He's you know what I mean? Like it's a it clearly he wants to fuck his daughter. Like all of these things, right? All of his daughters. All of his daughters. 
with the white women that you know, what makes them still support a guy? To me, I think it's more like battered woman syndrome. But <laughs> what is it that makes them support such a vile guy as a minority, as a, as a, as a female so, in general. There's a really interesting podcast and I, I'm sorry to give a plug to another podcast, but you, you would, you would be interested in this one and edit this out if you feel like you need mm-hmm. to. There's a, uh, a podcast called Make Me Smart. And, okay. um, earlier, maybe in 2018 or 2017, they did a, a an episode called Your Brain on Trump. Okay. And it makes the case, they had a psychologist on, and he talks about how there's a certain segment of the population that needs a strong father figure. Not a positive Mm -hmm. father figure, Mm -hmm. mind you, Mm -hmm. but a strong male in their life to tell them what to do. And it's men and and women, right? So they they gave examples of both men and women who suffer from this or who are afflicted by this or whatever. But to some extent, that's the case, right? There's, There's people who need to be told what to do. And you know, there's this mm-hmm. the story yeah. about Amy Coney Barrett being involved in this, you know, community where they were completely subservient to their husbands. Mm-hmm. And so I think to some extent that's part of the, the, the support. But I also think for the vast majority of white people, we have means, right? We have more means than most minorities do. And our bottom line concern is money. And I think a mm-hmm. lot of times Republicans have gotten better. Not necessarily justifiably, but they've gotten better coverage on, hey, they'll protect your money. They won't tax you. They're for smaller government. They're not going to take your money. And so that trumps, pardon the phrase, but that trumps every other concern. Yeah, well, he is a horrible in person and there is credible evidence that he, you know, sexually assaulted, you know, probably 20 some odd women. And yes, he's separating, you know, kids from their parents at the border, but they don't look like me. But, you know, my 401k is doing okay. Yeah. And ultimately, at the end of the day, I think that's the, the that is the biggest portion of the support among the white community for Republicans in, in general, but specifically for Trump. It's I'm doing OK. You know, my money's good. You know, that 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 that's very interesting because we go back to what you were saying. Um, again, we're talking about rural places. You're living in the trailer. Yeah, that, that, you know, that's, yeah, you, you, you don't have certain amenities and, and things right. like that. And that's, that's a good majority, right? Like, we're not talking about, you know, all of these white women who are on the real housewives of insert city here. You know, we're not talking about these women who live these lavish lives and, and things of that nature. We're talking about a woman who's, you know, the, doesn't have a job waiting for her blue collar husband to come home to the trailer. She's fixing food and, and, and all these things. And when I see interviews and things like that, they're really on some, well, boys will be boys. They have these conversations. They, they do these things. But that goes back to the, that segment of the population who needs that strong male voice in their life to tell them what to do. So they're two distinct Hmm. things, right? And I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a sociologist. This is just based on what I've heard and read. Right. Those folks that you're talking about are the same people who think, you know, the man's the head of the household and a Mm. a woman can't be a minister and a woman can't be president Mm. and all that kind of stuff. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because I heard a lot of that during the, during the the sides of the same coin. No, you're absolutely right. Because I remember having a, a conversation with this, this white woman at work that I, I really like, she was so fucking cool. She was an older woman, but we, she was just so fucking cool. And we were having a conversation one day and, um, she said that she voted for Trump for the only reason that she didn't like Hillary Clinton. Exactly. And I was like, well, what did Hillary Clinton do? Well, um, um, you know, I, you know, I just, you know, it was the emails. <laughs> We're right. praying right. that we could have only dealt with emails, uh, you for know, sure. four years ago. You know what I mean? Like emails, like that's what we're, t- yeah. And I, I just don't, you know, I, I, I feel like, you know, that's kind of like a man's job. You know, it's not really, you know, for a woman, although she works in a law office full of educated women of all races, right? 
educated women, you, you're the admin. She was an admin, right? And, and everybody knows, like, the admin, like, they get little praise for the work that they do, but they really run the office. They make sure that everything is where it needs to be. You're organized. You know how to get your right. babysitting for other people, you know, because they can't manage their calendars and do all of this shit. So even though you see all of this female energy around you and power and you know the contributions that you make every single day, it goes back to voting against your own interest and i keep echoing that through through, throughout this conversation because for me personally black white or indifferent i just don't understand how people vote against their own interest if 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 b hill was a you know a black multi-millionaire and he said look these tax cuts i mean these tax increases they're going to hit me. At least I know you're coming from a place of greed. You don't really care about the population or the majority of people. You're just like, I'm worried about my money. And even though that's not where I land, I'm kind of a greater good person. I still understand where you're coming from. I still understand you're coming from a place of greed. Like you want your money and that's what it is. The problem with me and, and this whole dialogue and why I keep going back to this is because I just clearly don't understand how anyone votes against their own best interests. But I think that's because they don't necessarily understand what they believe and why. There's no reason mm. behind it. And so I've I've gotten some criticism in the past. This goes back to what Brandon said about me being slightly obnoxious, is that I when I have a position, I have reasons why I have that position. I've thought it out and, right. and I can back that up. And I anticipate that other people who have a position are going to have similar reasons why. I may not agree with those reasons, but right. they're going right. to have those reasons. But when you have a person who has a stance that can't back that up and mm-hmm. and they can't convince me that they've thought this through, well, then that that's the issue you're running into right now. Yeah. Right? yeah. They have a position. Yeah. They don't know why they have that position. They just have that position. And in some cases, it's because they were born that way um, in some ca- and raised that way. In some cases, it's because that's what they've been told is in their best interest and they don't know that it's not. They just have this position. How far do you think your your education? You said that you were the first to graduate out of your family. Same on my I end. I was the first in my family to go to college at all. My grandma told me when I graduated from high school, um, <laughs> when I graduated from high school, my grandma told me, uh, we don't go to college. Rich folks go to college. We go to work. Mm. Uh, but no. So my education is, is seminal to my yeah. change in outlook on life and my ability to admit when I'm wrong. Yeah. 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 I, I think that, I think that is great. I think that is an evolution. I think that as long as a person is willing to change for me, that that's what matters, you know, to me, because we can't help the way that we were raised. You know, we can't help the, the fuel that was put into our heads and, you know, all of those things with how do how do you feel like your, your life has, um, do you feel like your life has improved since oh, yeah. making these political changes or do you feel, you know, well, how, okay. how, how is things going now? So ultimately I am lucky enough that almost nothing is going to affect my standard of living because I, I, I'm, I'm in a privileged class. It just lets us yeah. know what it is. But now I finally feel like I have, again, it's that responsibility to fix it. Right? Mm-hmm. I didn't yeah. hold slaves, but it's my responsibility to fix what my ancestors did. Same thing. My daughter spills milk. It's not my fault. She spilled the milk. It's my responsibility to clean it up. And, you know, yeah. I'm not a politician. I didn't institute Jim Crow laws and I didn't institute right. poll taxes and I didn't do the best I could to take money away from inner city schools. But it's my responsibility to fix that. So I think that's the biggest change in me. My life is not worse or better. I just understand now where I fit in and what my job is going forward. Yeah. Does that, does that feed you like on a spiritual level to know that you're doing the right thing or you're just like, this is the right thing. So I'm just gonna, I just, is it, is it a feeling or is it more of a a task? I think it's a little bit of both because here's the deal. I want Brandon's kids to grow up with the same opportunities my kids have. Yeah. Right. 
Um, we have a friend that we worked with, and I had this conversation with right after the Trayvon Martin uh, murder. I don't have to have a conversation with my kids about how to appropriately pull get pulled over, mm-hmm. right? It never occurred to me that that was a thing that black fathers have to do. Mm-hmm. And it's yep. now my responsibility to make sure that Brandon's son can go about his life in his daily routine and have the same benefits that my daughters are going to have because they're the, they're the, he's the same person they are. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, let's not forget about women as well. Sandra Bland, but you know, Breonna Taylor, all of that. There are, there are, you know, as, as a race, we're, we're being hunted in, in, in the streets. What do you feel about uh, the chant of defund the police? I a hundred percent support the position of removing some funding from especially major police forces and reinvesting that in other uh, organizations. So, for example, there's a couple of places up in the uh, upper northwest where they have taken a portion of the police budget and they've hired psychologists and EMTs and they've trained yeah. their, their their 911 operators to determine whether or not this needs a weapon holding cop or this is another issue that needs assistance from somebody high, more highly trained. And they've, I think there's one instance where they've had to call a police officer after they've sent the psychologist and the paramedic out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I read, I either read that or heard about it on the podcast too. Uh, that was, yeah, some, some legislation that was put in recently. So yeah, that, that's, that's brilliant because I mean, shit, I, I've, I've talked to a couple of police officers. They were like, I don't want to deal with that shit. Like I'm going to get criminals. Like I don't want to deal with fucking Johnny that's fucking tweaking out on his fucking meds. I don't, you know, like, I don't want to deal with that. I want to, you know, make sure that people are being, you know, being able to be safe and, 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 you know, uphold the law. He's like, but that shit is mental health shit. I don't want to have to, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want to have to be his, you know, his psychologist and executioner or, you know, judge yeah. at the same time. It's just too much going but you on. Know what? So. Ultimately, I, I do agree with the, the quote unquote defund the police, although I think that's a bad name to use because that's not what yeah, that means imagery. at all. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's the word. Gotta, I mean, I mean, based that. on based on what you what based on what you're saying, there's not going to be a way that we can uh, basically market this to have that segment of people agree with. Who, but who cares? Because well, it, it's yeah, opposed to education. Who cares? There are always people who well, are wrong. Right. And those are people who there are, are wrong. always people who are wrong. But the, the, the unfortunate part about this, uh, a good bulk of the people who are wrong are the people who are, quote unquote, in power. That's true. But that's changing. The electorate is changing. And what we really need to do as a society is we need to increase the funding to our schools. We need to look at the best schools yes. in the country. We need to find out what they're doing. And then we need to put as much money as possible into the schools that are underperforming as needs to be put in those schools to help those kill, those children be um, educated properly. We need to give a universal basic income for people so that they don't have to worry about going to work when they're sick. They don't have to worry about how they're going to pay their rent. They don't have to worry about how they're going to, um, you know, put food on their table because they've got at least something there. We need to provide single payer health care in this country so that people don't have to worry about getting sick and dying or going broke because they can't afford medical care. We need to reform yeah. our prison system so that we're not putting low-level drug offenders who are no harm to anybody ultimately but themselves behind jail, behind bars simply because Bladen County signed a contract with a for-profit prison company that says they got to mm-hmm. put this number of people in jail. Everything is about money. If you do those things, my personal opinion is that society gets better for all of us. Yeah. And I don't really care I- if... Jim Bob from Kernersville, North Carolina, doesn't agree with defund the police. I don't really care if he doesn't agree that uh, the prison systems are mismanaged and for profit. Doesn't really care to me if he's it doesn't really bother me if he's wrong, because there's always people on the wrong side of history. Mm -hmm. What 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 can what can be done to help? Individuals understand that if we do all of those things that you just mentioned, it makes it better for everyone. That, that, that means those, you know, Jim Bob and Kernersville gets the proper funding for his schools. And, and, you know, there'll be more, you know, individuals going to college and getting proper educations and, you know, being able to attain wealth in other ways. Like 
It, it benefits everybody. Yeah, it's, it's not just black people. It benefits everyone if we do this. See, I'll never thing, forget the, that. Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, oh, I was just I was saying, saying. I'll never forget that. I'll never forget <laughs> that. You know, the police officers during this whole shit was armed like Call of Duty, and our fucking medical professionals had on fucking trash bags yes, and right. shit, trying to. Yes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like that's not right. But I mean, even more so, like that goes back to fucking the the initial talk of universal health care. Like on the 1619 podcast, they said, I forgot the president at the time, but basically they were imp- introducing that uh, that bill to basically give everybody health care, universal health care in, in the country. But white folks didn't want black people to have health care. So they decided to go without like it's it's cut your nose off the spite your face. The only reason know? marijuana is illegal on the federal level is because Richard Nixon wanted to control the black vote and put black people in prison. That's a hundred percent accurate. Everything mm-hmm. goes back to that. Everything, Everything goes, goes back, back to, to racism staying, and slavery. Staying in power by any means necessary. I mean same thing Ronald blacks. Reagan did. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you know on that, the backs of blacks. Sure. Yeah. And then, yeah, and in the case of America, that's a hundred percent right on the backs of African Americans. Yes. Well, uh, we're and we're going to wrap this up. This has been a great conversation. Why is it, you know, never forget nine eleven, uh, never forget the Holocaust, never forget all of these tragic things that happen and also certain instances where reparations have been supplied but everyone wants to be stevie wonder to slavery and feels like that was a long time ago and you know uh descendants of slaves don't deserve reparations and things of that nature what what have been your thoughts i wish i knew the answer to that question because in my opinion they're exactly like I mean, we are 100 years removed, which is not that far from the last person being actually enslaved in this country. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's not that far back. And it's not that different from the Holocaust. And Germany has been paying reparations to Holocaust survivors since World War II ended. So in my opinion, there is no difference. And there shouldn't be a question as to whether or not we do this. Whether, Whether it's individual payments to folks, which I'm fine with, or... Tons of investment in minority communities in the in the education and housing and basic income avenues. I don't care how it's done, but I wish I could answer that question for you. I have no idea what the, yeah. the objection to it is. Gotcha. Um, before we get into um, James's outlets and where he's located, do you have any anything else we needed to talk to? James about B. Anything that's coming to mind that think nah, you think man. the listeners want to get from, you know, a, a white male perspective? I can't think of it. I think we covered a, a, a good bit of information. We did. Um, that's why I knew James would be great to to speak to. Um, just because these are our regular conversations on a daily basis. That yeah. again, like I said, start with work and then end up going into shit like this. So um, yeah. That's so, what's nah, up. I'm good. I don't I can't think of anything else. I appreciate you coming. I am the compliance and and ethics uh, manager for the company that I work for. Right. So I'm the person that's like, "Uh uh-uh, we ain't talking about none of this at work. (laughs) Like this ain't the place. This ain't the place for all of that. But but it is. And I would argue, here's why I would argue with it. There are, there are guardrails at work that can't be crossed. And so if you're going mm-hmm. to have these hot button issue conversations, if you're going to have these conversations where people tend to have very seated and deep rooted viewpoints, have them at work because there is there's a built in safety break, right? I'm not I can't say what I want to say cuz it's going to get me fired. So let me think about how I'm going to say it in a way that's a little bit more socially acceptable right Mm -hmm. to get my point across because immediately when you have to stop and think about how should i say this that's not offensive you start to understand why it was offensive in the first place you understand why it was offensive in the first place there are individuals that clearly do not 
understand what they're saying is offensive. There, there, there's this, this, this joke, uh, about this white comedian that I like, and he was talking about, um, the word midget, right? And they called him in and they said, you, you, you can't say the word midget. Like it, it, it's offensive. And it's like, why they're, you know, they're midgets. He was like, it's just like saying the N word. Right. And he was like, well, I know it's not the same thing because we're saying the word midget, but we're not saying what the N word actually is. <laughs> you know what That's I mean? So, yeah. you know, you know, so, so it's not the same thing then. And sitting in the type of seat that I sit in, I have individuals who bring up conversations. First of all, you're not going to get anywhere with politics or religion. The workplace is not the place for that. That's not the place. It's not. I'm not saying that you guys can't have your conversations. That's not what I'm saying. No, nah, we talk saying, individually on ourselves. Yeah, oh, yeah, it. yeah. So that's yeah. not what I'm saying. I'm just saying but based on his it. his corporate environment. You know, uh, you know, you should be able to have those conversations at work. No, because there are a lot of conversations at work, and everybody comes from a different place. We came to work to accomplish whatever this white man's goal is, because he probably owned the company. We we're here to be cogs in this machine. Work is not the place for you to be free, right? And black people, of all people, know that because we go in and we code switch every day to be normal, to to do the normal things that are the white things. We come in, we change who we are, we speak differently, we act differently to assimilate. So I feel like if I have to assimilate to be appropriate for your culture, then as a whole, regardless, we need to all be comfortable assimilating to have a productive work environment. Because at the end of the day, I go home, I don't give a fuck if you're at a fucking Klan rally or whatever. Just don't bring that shit in here to me. You know? That's a fair perspective. And and to be clear, Brandon and I work in civil litigation every single day where people are getting sued for all kinds of stuff. So I get what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. So you see, I well, can go we left the least really quick. Segregated when we're at work, we don't have these conversations at home. We don't have these conversations in church. We don't have these conversations at the ball field when we're watching t ball because we're with people who look like us. So it sounds like you need to diversify your surroundings versus bringing that's one hundred percent accurate. That's one hundred percent accurate. Yeah, yeah, and like I said, but listen, that can't happen it, unless we're comfortable with each other. And my personal opinion is that you're going to start getting comfortable where you're more immersed in. My first experience, my, my first experience, intimate experience with a black man was my freshman year at East, Carolina, East Carolina when I, he was my roommate. That was the very first time I was in the same room for more than a class. Let's not say intimate though. That was just weird. Hey. Just saying, let's use another that word. Ain't that ain't what I meant. <laughs> he was a black you know, man. He was in my different. bedroom. They different. Uh, it was intimate. He was massive. Yeah. I used to watch him get undressed. Nah. Okay. Tasty <laughs> Hayes. This ain't getting edited out. It's not getting edited out. Nah, nah, nah. Uh, this is staying in. Look, this is great. Like, I would have never we been forced joke to this ask part. those questions, right? Had I not had to come to terms with the fact that Richard was a damn good dude. His name is Richard. His name is Richard. And he's Dick. Dick. He's <laughs> <laughs> so so, actually a Richard the Third. So it was it was two dicks ahead. <laughs> <laughs> see, see, all right, take that. We all That's found great. that funny. It is what it is. If we would have said that joke at work, I would have been like, "What the fuck is your problem? Why did you feel like that was okay?" You know what I mean? Like, then that's what happens. That's what happens. People are like, but it's funny. But it's okay, you know, like all of those things. And then it like shit goes left. Now, I think that if you want to, I, I get what you're saying about, you know, having a diverse environment at work. And I think that the way that you and B Hill go about it is y'all have formed a relationship outside of work. Now, what you do after five o'clock, what y'all decide to talk about after five o'clock is fine. But I also want you to know that when you do some bullshit or B Hill does some bullshit and y'all mad at each other, Y'all gonna come to a person like me and be like, yeah, and I know he racist because he said X, Y, Z when we were out having a beer the other day. Or he talked about this and, and all of these personal conversations come into place when we're talking about something related to work. Because now you've gotten a promotion that he wanted or, you know, guys found out you smashing the same secretary. Or, you know what I mean? Like what shit happens. And like I say, I sit in a seat where I see all the bullshit. I see all of what happens, the the offshoots of these relationships and things like that. Me personally, I'm not really intimate 
<laughs> air quotes with with people from work, but I understand it. But I do have, you know, I've had relationships with, uh, you know, there there was a white girl I used to work with, and I remember it was uh, the first Obama election, and we're sitting there, and she lives in um fucking North Carolina, Pitts, not Pittsburgh, some fucking rural part of North Carolina, and we're sitting there watching the election results, and we look at her like, wait. Did your broke ass vote Republican? Like, <laughs> mm. like what the fuck? Like, why, wh- you know, why did you do that? And, you know, she goes back to kind of some of the things that you said about basically it's just been ingrained in her and she don't know any other way, even though, you know, she get she take a lot of black dick a lot. You know what I mean? Like you understand, <laughs> you know what I mean? You, you take from it what you want. Right. You learn what you want. And I think that that's the, that's the, the, the summary to a lot of this is that education is key. Yeah. hundred percent. Indeed. Well, Mark, Mark, education Mark is key. said the only known cure for um, prejudice is education and travel. I agree. And wasn't he racist though? Uh, he was. Maybe. Probably. I mean, he had to be. Everybody well, was, he racist was white. At that time frame. <laughs> Yeah, he was white. Yeah. Whole very fan and all that shit. Yeah. Cause it was like yeah. a black dude that fucking that didn't he frame the black dude for murder or some shit in Huckleberry Fan? I can't Y'all remember. Y'all been on that bullshit. You about to kill a mockingbird. Yeah, nah, that's Atticus Finch and the boys. Nah. It was something <laughs> with Huckleberry Finch and Finn. the crew. I'm ashamed to tell <laughs> you. I'm sorry. It was some shit. They had a they befriended a black dude or some shit. I can't remember. I'm ashamed to tell you. I, I, I don't know Huckleberry the details, fan. but I did hear he was racist. Oh, really? Yeah, Huckleberry Finn was good. It was racist. I'm pretty sure he 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 definitely yeah, it was something with a black dude, man, and I think Huckleberry Finn like blamed it on the black dude. So maybe it was like covert like trying to uncover racism in a way. I don't know. I can't remember. It's been I was fucking no, seven we're not or about eight to give him all that credit. Finn, but <laughs> what 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 do you think what do you think we can ever get to an ideal place? We're never going to get to a perfect world. That's not where we're getting. But do you feel like we'll ever get to a better place where conversations like this may be less? I'll, I'll frame it that way. I think humans are going to find a reason to hate other humans. And if it's not race, mm. it's going to be something else. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we don't hate Muslims necessarily because they're brown skin. We hate them because they're a different religion, right? It has nothing to do with their skin color generally. Oh, well, well, I'm sure brown well, is that's, the cherry yeah, that's, you know, on top of the cake. It, it, you know what I mean? On top of the it's ice cream. It's a benefit you know? uh, from yeah. that. From right, that exactly. But, you know. Wait, they think differently and they're brown? Right. The fuck? Keep, get them yeah, out of right. here. How you not be pure white and think about this manipulated God the only way it's that gonna, we've created? Uh, the only way it's going to change in America is if we can get everybody on the same socioeconomic level. We can get everybody on the same education level. We can give everybody the same opportunities so that we can all see that we're the same fucking person. Yeah. We yeah. are a hundred percent the same person. Too much like right though, man. Well, James, thank you so much. Thank you so much. This has been an insightful conversation. Indeed. Um, you are the, the, uh, the, the first white person to grace this mic yeah. and grace this show. Um, and you know, we appreciate the allies like yourself that are willing to learn and evolve and, and you know, and, and unlearn facts, me facts, facts. We, 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 we appreciate that. Um, tell your friends, <laughs> you know, educate it as, as many people, um, as possible. Because like I said, we don't want shit, but equality. That's it. We don't, we don't, yeah, we don't want to take from anything. We want rights. We just want to be able to live and breathe and be happy and live our lives and mind our business. That's another thing. Take that back to the, to the white people. Mind your business. Don't go over <laughs> Mind, I, messing I told with people. That. It's funny you say that, right? Cause like it was, this girl, <laughs> I know, we gotta, we gotta get off soon, but. It was a girl. It, we got like a group chat between us at work and shit. A couple of the people we work with, you know, James, like some girl, she was some millennial young girl. Like she posted on LinkedIn of all places that she, obviously you have all your name and all your demographic information, the company that you work for. And she says like, has anybody ever had like a type A boss and how do you deal with it or some shit like that? Like on LinkedIn, not like Facebook or something. This is. And she was linked so to James her boss. Like, I'm, <laughs> yeah she was linked to her boss so james was like he texted group chat and like you know what i'm saying did a screenshot or whatever and uh 
And he was like, I'm comp- I feel compelled to say something to tell her to, you know, I was like, and I just text him, mind the business that pays you, sir. He was like, that's <laughs> right. profound. <laughs> like, yeah. let, that has nothing to do with you. Leave it alone. <laughs> let it be. So yes. again, you know, we fucking, we ingratiating people with fucking, with uh, diversity and inclusion training and by ideals and principles <laughs> of, of yes. the black and white community. So absolutely. For sure. Like just the, like, they got to mind the business. Like they'll walk yeah, half a block mind the business. just to go knock on somebody's door and tell them right. what they're doing inside of their house. They don't agree with yeah. a block down the street. Right. You know what I mean? Like, right. fuck, why are y'all so fucking nosy? Like as a group, like why are y'all so fucking nosy? And then never prepare to defend yourself. Like how you go over and punch somebody and not expect them to hit you back? Right. right. <laughs> right. Do you ever yeah. laugh at that? Like, all right, so like black people, we understand that one black pe- person represents all of us. So when we see some bullshit, we're like, uh, here we go. Like, because of y'all, because that's how we feel, because that's how y'all put on us. Y'all gonna put them on the news, all that other stuff. Do you ever feel that way about these Karens and yes. these Kevins? In fact, Brandon has said to me, y'all people before. And I'm like, no, my <laughs> fucking ain't, ain't y'all people, because not all of us. <laughs> feel that way not all of us that's how we feel welcome but to funny story i did make the mistake of calling brandon the name of another black man once and he's never let me forgive that good brandon stay on his oh yeah no you already know i'm I'm, I'm, this was like six seven years ago like and the dude that he called me (laughs) is like i mean we we don't look shit alike besides the fact that we're tall and we're black he got hair like i don't have hair He's like, a, like <laughs> extremely muscle. You know, he used to play football and shit. So he got like a football physique. You know what I'm saying? You like Hakeem, nothing though? like I got a beard. He doesn't have a beard. He got a South like, Carolina nothing. accent. You don't. Yeah, he's from South Carolina. So I'm nothing. From North Carolina. Just that you're black. Nothing. Nah, just that we're black. <laughs> just that's it. And we work at the same spot. You know, and we was yeah. it was only two of us <laughs> or two or three of us that worked there. So even more the reason that you shouldn't get us confused. It's not like you got a, lot, like a whole lot of fucking pick from. That's, that's Let me tell you too. something about that's black fair. people. <laughs> the worst thing you can do in corporate America is get the same office or seat as another black person previous to you. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's fair. That was the same gender because now you're that person. Like, so y'all see that we look totally different. I'm a whole new person. Like, but there right. was a black girl that sat in that seat. I thought you were her and you just changed your hair. So I made it a point to call him like every other white dude in the office yep. like for a whole year. Yep. <laughs> Don't call him every- hey, what's yes. up with Mark? Hey, hey right. Josh. Yeah. And again, that's Richard. Fair. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. It's, it's, it's been a pleasure. Tell everybody like what you're into, where they can find you, what information you feel like we need to He's know. He's in the men name. <laughs> He's in the <laughs> tasty, men and, hasty man. Yeah, uh, look, hasty. So <laughs> the only thing I got going on is I decided to start a blog right before the election to try to put my thoughts on paper and try to understand what my evolution was. Uh, I, I read the book Hillbilly Elegy which is sort of about the plight of poor white America and sort of where where the Trump voter came from. And mm-hmm. after that, I decided, you know, that guy was a lot like me and I wanted to put my stuff on paper. So I got a blog. It's hastyethnocentrism.blogspot.com. So if you're interested in hearing any of my stupid rants, you can go there. But the so you might want to get a URL that's smaller than I'm that, cheap, man. <laughs> so cheap. people can find you. I'm cheap. You're rich. I gotta use the free stuff. <laughs> you you, listen, you, you can pay in white privilege, right? This man bought a pay six thousand dollar go kart to go from the driveway to the garage, and then man, started about the fucking golf cart. I get it right. Close. He has his own golf cart. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can afford a vanity to... URL that's yeah, just man. like jamesthoughts.com. Then yeah, hasty astrocentric tall. White guy glasses dot com late. Like, what the fuck are we doing? Smell it for him. Right. His, have an intimate his encounters and in, <laughs> with his first black I know man. Brandon will appreciate this. I'm gonna buy LeBron is the goat dot com. Hey. That's probably already taken, bro. Hey, don't be culture vulturing. Right. <laughs> Listen, spell that out for us. Cause, cause I do want people to find it and I, I want to find it myself. So, yeah, what, so spell it out for us. Uh, it's, it's more of a play on how I figured out that I, who, who I was and where I came from. Hasty, H A S T Y. Okay. Ethnocentrism, E T H N O C E N T R I S M dot blogspot dot com. Thank you. 
uh, I will um, attempt to type in all those letters and check that out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, really, you know, we appreciate you. We appreciate um we appreciate any type of allies. And again, you know, we talk a lot of shit about white people because I think you guys deserved a lot of shit being talked about you. However, we do understand that, you know, is, is, is not this, you know, monolithic thing. You know, it, everyone is diverse and, you know, you, you have your things and you're out here spreading the word as, as much as you can. And even if it's just a change with you, you know, we 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 appreciate that. So thank you for for coming on the show. Um, Indeed, uh, for sure. Well, thanks for having me. I, uh, I second all that. And uh, yeah, so um, check him out at hasty ethincentralism dot blogspot dot com. That's the most uncool name I've ever heard in my life. That's uh, cool. but that's, that's that's white. That's he ain't got no yeah, season that shit yet. Is a box he got put some season on it. <laughs> that's just the most vanilla ice cream I've like, a big tub. <laughs> like you didn't even include. It's not even Neapolitan. It's just fucking like a big tub of vanilla. Like you don't have any strawberry. It's no chocolate in there. It's nothing but vanilla. All right. <laughs> that's what the fuck their name is. Yeah, damn. But we man. appreciate the motivation. We no appreciate season. the motivation At behind all. it. All right, guys. I appreciate it too. All right. Well, I want to thank y'all for listening to the show. Make sure y'all subscribe to the show. Check us out at theancientshow.com. That's the X where the I will be. And y'all know y'all can follow us on social. We're on Twitter, IG, all that. Do you have an IG? Nah, I'm off of Facebook. Anything Facebook, I'm done with. Facebook's dangerous to America. You don't have Instagram? (laughs) Nope. No oh, what? So the Facebook. only way we can get to this long ass blog name is to type in all of well, that. I'm on, into I'm on the... Twitter, Hasty Ethno, on Twitter. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no. Oh yeah, it was too. Much. Did they have like a uh, a name, a character limit in the name? They did, actually. right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nigga, hey, super califragilistic. Guess we have a woke white dude. Mary Poppins gotcha. over here. <laughs> oh, but y'all leave a comment, and y'all know we like to end the show. Uh, with a uh, quote, and today's quote is: "If it doesn't bring you peace, profits, or purpose, then don't give it your time, energy, or attention." And until next week, I want y'all to manifest your destinies. Continue to wash your hands, wear a mask. You know, Black Lives Matter, and the marathons continues. We're out. Yep, yep.